Hi folks, this is Ben from Road to VR, and I am here with Greg, who is the CEO of Fourth Dimension Displays. And can you tell me a little bit about, about what you're doing at GDC? Yeah, I can. We are a micro display manufacturer, so we manufacture small, high resolution displays. Um, we, our, tr our history over the last 10 years has been in the professional markets, very high in professional markets. And we, we would like to encourage, we'd like to, to get the technology which is used in a number of high-end professional markets into the gaming market. Uh, and for the last 18 months or so, we've been trying to um, evangelize uh, immersive VR technology into the gaming market. Um, slightly lonely occupation initially, but obviously more recently, Oculus has, is, has made a huge strides in, in, in pushing sort of new generation virtual reality into this market, which is great. Um, so that we're here, we're not, we don't have a product to sell here. What we do is we have a technology, we have a, uh, a component that we're trying to encourage companies in this market to adopt uh, and, and expand the use of VR in general. And can you tell me exactly what you're showing off today? Yes, we have a head-mounted display uh, that has uh, a separate display for each eye. So it's true three-dimensional, sh showing a separate left and right video channel to each eye. Each uh, eye has an SXGA micro display, so 1280 by 1024 pixels. They are a technology called ferroelectric liquid crystal on silicon, FLCOS. And this allows uh, very crisp, clear video to be, to be displayed. We've made our reputation in the micro display market on offering the best image quality. Uh, and so when you put it into a head-mounted display, um, you can get this very um, smear-free, very crisp, fast-moving video, deal with fast head movements. Uh, and we're showing that uh, with standard off-the-shelf content, uh, literally using Half-Life 2 that was bought in a normal store. Uh, we've put some 3D drivers on it, so we're putting it into the headset. Uh, the headset's also got a head tracker, uh, so you can look around the, the environment and, and, and immerse yourself in the Half-Life 2 environment. And uh, so what makes that technology uh, suitable for this type of application? Well, it, there's, there's a number of ways you can do uh, a virtual reality head-mounted display, but a, a, a classic way of doing it is to have a small display for each eye. So if you want to have a, a high-performance headset, you need a high-resolution small display. Uh, there are a number of different micro-display technologies. Uh, the advantages of ours, uh, first advantage is you don't get separate red, green, and blue subpixels. We put the red, the green, and the blue on top of each other. So you can't see any, any frame door effect or any black screen effect in our displays. The liquid crystal we use um, switches very, very quickly, a um, hundred times quicker than a laptop liquid crystal does. And that allows us to get very crisp movement. We don't get any of these sort of smearing effects that you get in, in slower liquid crystal display uh, panels. And because it's a uh, reflective micro display, you can make, uh, you can put a lot of uh, illumination on it, so we, we don't have any problems with trying to make the display bright, brighter because the, the illumination is provided by LEDs, which of course you can just have as bright as you want, really. Um, so we can make bright, uh, wide field of view, high image quality um, headset without any visible black frame or, or sub-pixelation. And you were telling me that you also have even higher resolution displays? Absolutely. Um, we, we are trying to take the technology further and further to produce the best, the best quality, image quality we can. So we've just launched at the end of last year, we launched our 2048 by 1536 pixel QXGA resolution display. So that's the same resolution as an iPad 3, but compressed into a display that's about 0.8 of an inch in diagonal. So a very, very high DPI. Um, and uh, this allows you to produce a, a full color display that's got three million pixels. Uh, and that's the world's, we would, we, it's the world's highest resolution full color near to eye micro display. But we also think with the advances that we've done in the way we drive the display, we've also got the best image quality, uh, not just the best resolution. If the consumer VR market takes off, uh, in what kind of arena do you want to play? Uh, we, uh, we're coming from the top down. Uh, the early adopters of our technology were primarily military training, um, a lot of it for pilots, uh, mission rehearsal systems. Uh, it's used in some medical, surgical training systems. So very, very high-end professional systems. So we're absolutely confident that we can deliver the, the, the best image quality because we're used in, in, in mission-critical, high-performance um, systems. 
So we're coming down from the, from the, the top end. Those systems are made in very low quantities and are inevitably quite expensive. We believe as volumes go up, we can bring the price point down. We've done some engineering and done some assessment of this. And we believe that a head-mounted display at about $1,500 with our high-end micro displays can be delivered at, at that price point. Now, that's not going to be the mass market product. But there is, we believe there's sufficient market who want the highest performance head-mounted displays and have got the money to, to, to be able to afford that high performance display for us to, to carve out a, a portion of that, of that market. And are you personally interested in playing VR games or is this just kind of a subset of the micro display business? Um, there's two aspects to it. One of it is obviously an opportunity for us to sell micro displays, but I actually do enjoy it as well. I mean, I've used our uh, head-mounted displays with our displays in, in helicopter simulators, in surgical simulators, in tank simulators, and I enjoy doing all those, and I enjoy putting playing Half-Life 2 in, in our headset here. So while a part of its business is also quite a lot of enjoyment and, and enthusiasm uh, for where we're trying to take take this, uh, we've we've also uh, put a motor racing simulator in it, uh, and that's very usable. You can you can do an extended period of time uh, in that wearing the head-mounted display, and I've done that, uh, and it's very enjoyable. It's very compelling because you feel like you're, you're there. You know. You, you, you've been removed from your real environment and taken into this virtual world so you can focus on it fully. Can you tell me about the, the head-mounted display itself? I know you, didn't, you guys don't make the head-mounted display, you make the micro display, but can you tell me a little, bit, a little bit about that system? Yeah, absolutely. So when we were, doing, when we were producing this demonstrator, we had to decide what head-mounted display to use. And we have, a, we have a number of different customers who produce head-mounted displays using our display. So we looked at them all. And we had to select one that was quite quick to put on and set up because obviously on a show booth you can't afford to spend five minutes adjusting all the optics and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that made it quite difficult to use a very wide field of view one because most of those require quite a lot of setting up. Uh, so we do have customers producing head-mounted displays with 120 degree diagonal field of view, 110 degree diagonal field of view. We opted for a product from one of our longest standing customers, a company called MVIS in Virginia, and it's their 60 degree field of view product. Um, it's got full overlap uh, and what that means is that for the left and right eye totally superimpose upon each other. Some products in this market have partial overlap so you get a wider field of view but only the central bit achieves full stereo vision. In this product it's, it's, a, it's a full overlap system so each eye is seeing 60 degree diagonal field of view. It's got to say it's got the SXGA uh, displays, it's got an Intersense uh, head tracker um, and that's the product that we that's that's the product we're showcasing in the demonstrator. But there's probably 10 or 15 other different HMD products out there in the professional market which have our displays. And how interested um, in that high-end field are people in getting pretty good um, displays, but at a lower cost if you eventually do them in scale for the consumer market? Um, I think what, what we've what we've been trying to work out is is, is what's the What's the relationship between price and market and volume? Um, as the price point comes down, the market does grow. Uh, it's not just a straight line. You, you, when you hit certain price points, suddenly you open up a whole, whole new market opportunity. So we've been looking at things like arcades and uh, digital out-of-home entertainment. Uh, and that's, that's, that's at a significantly lower price point than, say, the military training market is. Um, but not as low as the consumer market needs to be. So we've been trying to understand the different sort of market segments uh, here. But, but we believe if you, can, if you can get down to the $1,500, you've, you've got a consumer product. Uh, and we be, you know, this, the feedback we've had um, today and yesterday at the show uh, suggests that people very, like our headset, they like the technology that we've, that we've got in there, uh, and there would be people willing to buy it. Uh, and that's not an unreasonable price point. If you look at the price that people pay for high-end graphics cards, if you look at the price people paid for flat-screen TVs when they first came out, it's in that, it's in, you know, these, this is not a price point that's, that's that difficult in the consumer market. Um, and certainly you, we could get a significant volume compared with our current business if, we, if, we, if, we, if our customers had a product at that, at that price point. So if consumer VR takes off, it's going to potentially open up uh, a new sales channel for you guys. Um, do you think, is this kind of a, a long shot or do you think there's a real opportunity here? 
Um, that's a that's a that's a very good question. Um, I think the first I think I'm right in saying the first virtual reality HMD was first put together in 1968. Um, we all know that it's been tried tried before. There was um, there was the arcade stuff, virtuality in the 90s. Sony had glass trons, these types of products. However, there's also good reason to believe that the time is ripe for another attempt. Uh, a number of reasons for this. First of all, clearly the image generation capability in the home has advanced dramatically, and especially in the last 10 years. Rendering 3D in for two channel, two eyes, in the home, in real time, is perfectly possible now, whereas it wasn't then. Um, the micro display technology, or data display technology in general, has moved forward dramatically. So domestic VR is not going to have to pay for any of these. These have all been, these have all been done and achieved. The other thing which has happened very recently, and we're now talking within the last six months, is an increasing um, or, or a move towards accepting near-to-eye displays worn on the head. So while something like the Google Glass is not in any way going to be an immersive gaming experience, it is still putting a display on the head. And there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for that. People seem to be eager to get the product out there. Undoubtedly, an awful lot of other companies are also working on similar products. So a lot of the hurdles that were there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, have now been dealt with. And domestic VR, will, games, consumer VR, will not have to pay for any of these. They've all been, they've all been done. So the, there is the opportunity, which hasn't been there before, to leverage all this investment and all this production capability that, that's already, that's already been, or been done and in a lot of instances, like the rendering, is already in the home anyway. Um, so I think it, it stands more chance now. I think uh, what the, uh, the profile and the effort that Oculus are putting in with the Rift is, is huge. Um, they probably have the best opportunity that anyone's had for a long time to really get some volumes up into the, into the consumer market. Um, and I think that's great. I, I, I think that's, a, that's really good news. And I think paralleling that with stuff like the, like the glass and putting that on the head probably means that we've had the best opportunity ever to actually get consumers wearing head-mounted displays, near-to-eye displays in a whole range of different form factors. Um, speaking of Google Glass, is that kind of see-through AR technology relevant to what you do at all? Do you do any see-through displays or is there an opportunity to uh, put your display in the side and have it projected out into the eye? Uh, we, as I say, we go for, for high performance um, displays with the best image quality and one of the facets of our displays compared with some of the other micro display technologies, we've got quite a big display. That helps when you're doing a wide field of view head mounted display because you, the, the optics gets easier if you have a big, big display. It does mean it's not a particularly suitable display for, for a, a consumer eyewear glass type, type product. Having said all that, we do have some customers who have taken our displays and produced uh, what you might call immersive see-through displays. So instead of it just being a small display in the corner, it actually is across the a field of view for augmented reality applications. But again, probably like our, our sort of mainstream pro professional immersive business, again, that sort of high performance augmented reality is probably only a niche market to start with. There's some interesting opportunities in things like uh, tourism and history. Uh, where you can, you can superimpose in a very um, vivid way perhaps old buildings. Um, so if you've got a, um, an architectural site, you can actually put a headset on and see the, 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 the old building that would have been there in, in situ in the real world. Um, you can imagine architecture, again, very, um, very good application where you can you can allow someone to see a building that hasn't been built yet in its real environment on the street or in a field or wherever, wherever it's going to be, to be built. Um, but it, I don't think those are going to be mainstream in the way that some of the, the, the Google Glass type applications, it will be a, again be a subset of it. But our display can be very high brightness, which is what you need when you're doing AR because you've got to superimpose it over the brightness of the real world. So it is a suitable technology. Um, but the size and performance we're at probably means we're only going to be in a, in a niche part of that, of that business. How many nits are we talking about with your display? Um, well, because it's an external illumination source, you can have pretty much whatever you want. It is used in some projection applications. Um, it's used not as a display to actually project images uh, in, in uh, 3D optical measurement systems. 
um, and it's actually used in some military visor projection systems, which are very high brightness. So there, there is no brightness problem with our display. You just turn the LEDs up and the, and the image gets, gets brighter. So uh, we call it scalable brightness. You, you can pretty much have what, have what you want with no adverse impact on the display. Sure, your power consumption goes up because you're putting more power in, but, but that's really the only effect. Yeah. And so you mentioned that uh, achieving wide field of views uh, with this type of micro display can get bulky and difficult. Do you think that there is a solution there that partners making head mounted displays could figure out, or are these, as they're kind of a limitation in the field of view, uh, uh, scaling with the bulkiness of the head mount? Uh, it's probably it's probably always going to be true that a wider field of view is going to require more complexity in the optics than a smaller field of view. The thing which I always point out um, is that the amount of money that has been invested over the years in the optics for immersive head-mounted displays is, in the context of, say, a consumer technology development, incredibly small. There's not been a lot of money spent. It's not been a big market. There hasn't been the opportunity to spend hundreds of millions on development, which there will be on a lot of the other products at, at this show. So no one really knows where it can go to because there hasn't been big R&D teams, big, big developmental spends on it. And I think there will be a lot of advances in optics. I think, I think a lot of what's going on now with the glass and, and the consumer uh, gaming HMDs will drive investment. And I think there's great opportunities in the optics for new intellectual property for people who are doing R&D in that area to start using perhaps uh, different materials, lighter weight lenses, coming up with some clever optical schemes to reduce um, the size. We've seen a few. Um, will those ones work well? I don't know, but there are innovative ideas out there that as, as the market grows, will attract the investment. Uh, and once that starts happening, I think we'll start seeing the size, complexity and weight come, come down. And have you uh, had any people approach you and that were actually interested in taking your displays and putting them in consumer head mounts? Uh, yes, we have had a number. Obviously, I can't talk about who, but but you know, brand known known brands as well as small companies. So yeah, we've had a number number of discussions. There's quite a few discussions still going on at the moment. And are those relevant to the gaming market or other other simulation? We've had, we've had some dialogue in the gaming market. I. I I don't know whether they will come to, come to fruition, but we are talking to companies in that market. Very good. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, Greg. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was, it was great talking with you. Thank you very much.